let me know we're recording awesome uh i'll give about a minute or so please text your group leader the score grab your notepad um we're going to dive into tonight's uh, um bible study with earl uh so we did the kingdom study last um so this is very very important that's why those three questions are key guys because before jumping into the next bible study i'll meet with earl say earl it's great to see you um Let's, let's pray and then let's review the Bible study beforehand and then I'll go through those three questions. Remember, what was the three things we talked about? How does, what is the kingdom? Uh, well, it's the church. Awesome. Way to review your notes. Uh, how do you get into the kingdom? You have to get baptized by water and spirit. There it is. That's awesome. And who's a part of the kingdom? It's made up of disciples only. That's awesome, Earl. So just, just to recap what we talked about last week, how soon do you want to get into the kingdom? As soon as possible. Awesome. That's great. So we're going to jump into today's Bible study. Tonight, we're going to do a Bible study called Light and Darkness, Earl. So let's uh, go ahead and go turn our Bibles here to 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, um, John, do I have host rights so I can use the, um, uh, the whiteboard? If not, can you give it to me? Where's John? John doesn't like me. John, you're still there? I think he's gone. John, Matt, Sophia, anybody? Any whiteboard abilities? Come on, John. He got taken by an angel? Amen. Um, all right. Well, we'll, we'll, go ahead, we'll, there it is. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, so prior to doing this Bible study, um, you really should be doing a spiritual timeline um, with the person you're studying with. Now, in a lot of cases, I think more often than not, especially that we live in the Bible belt here of the nation, you probably want to be doing the spiritual timeline at discipleship, okay? Um, just because we live in a very religious society, and I think it's important for you to have this, this information up front so you can best help and guide the person you're studying with. So, uh, I am going to do the spiritual timeline as if I was doing it at discipleship, okay? And I'll call out if for whatever reason I chose not to do it at discipleship, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain what I would admit if I did it at this point, okay? So let's go through it. So Earl, um, you know what? Just so I can better um, help you, let's see, uh, allow Zoom to share your screen. Uh, what's going on here? What is it? Come on, bro. Um, okay, let's do that. Zoom will not be able to record the content on your screen in a minute. Quit now, later. So for some reason, uh, John is not letting me do it. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, awesome. All right, so okay. spiritual timeline. All right, so Earl, um, remind me, how old are you? I am 23. All right, awesome. So you're 23 years old. Call me out, Fernando. There it 23. is. 23. 23, and you were one years old at one point. So we'll say that. So a couple questions that I typically ask the spiritual time. And remember, the assumption here is we're doing this at discipleship, okay? I'll call out which questions I will not ask if I'm doing it at the Land Darkness Bible study. So um earl tell me approximately what age did you start believing in jesus start believing in jesus uh i would say probably when i was two all right all right two years old all right not bad so two years old got it and normally if i am writing on a piece of paper or something and it's a little easier to navigate than the whiteboard on zoom i would just draw it on the timeline okay but just for so everyone can see what i'm doing uh, I'm just going to do it here. All right. So, um, great. Um, John, so, uh, I'm um, John, uh, uh, Earl, uh, when did you become a Christian? What age? Become a Christian. Uh, become a Christian. Uh, Let's go that, seven. That probably, you know, yeah, I think seven. Yeah, seven. Okay, seven. Seven years old. Now, now Earl, tell me, what, what did that look like, though? Like, how, how, did, you, how did you become a Christian? Um, did you uh, say, well, um, what was it? Did you... Uh, say a prayer? Did you go on the altar? What, 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 what did you do? Uh, well, if I can remember back, um, yeah, First I, communion. I think no, no, it wasn't that. Um, 
I think it was a sinner's prayer. I read the sinner's prayer, prayed that. Um, I remember because I was just learning how to read and I remember that. Okay, awesome. So perfect. So let's, let's, let's jot that down, seven years old. All right. Now, um, when were your sins forgiven? So when were sins forgiven? You know what? Um, I would say that when I got into high school, I really got serious. I mean, I really got serious. Uh, and I think at that point, I think at that point, uh, my sins were forgiven. All right. So what, by what age? I would say I was 14. Okay. So at 14, you got serious. Got it. Okay. So now when did you receive the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. You know what? It has to have been around high school because I remember I went to a summer camp and I was with my friends and they had the guitars out, you know, and it was at night. I remember that it was, we were next to a bonfire and I remember the songs were just really like moving. And then, and I, I, I felt something, it felt something. And uh, I, I will say maybe like 15. Okay. So 15, got it. So at 15, uh, you got you got the Holy Spirit uh, is when you felt something. Got it. Okay. Now, uh, have have you ever been baptized, Earl? When were you baptized? Um, As baby. Uh, no, no. Uh, I th when was I baptized? Let me see. It was. I think it, you know it was when I started. Let's see. How old? What? How old are you when you go into fifth grade? About 10. That's my, my daughter. 10 or 11. Oh, okay. 10, 10, 11. So about 10 years old. Got it. All right. So 10 years old. Got it. Um, last but not least, um, Earl, uh, when did you become a disciple? A disciple. 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 Uh, I think I've heard of that. I, could, I don't think... I don't think I'm a disciple. I mean, I, 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 never, I, don't, I really don't know. Okay, so we don't, we don't know or maybe no. No. Okay, got it. All right. That gives me a good uh, kind of landscape, Earl, to see how I can help you. What we want to see, Earl, throughout the Bible studies is how this conversion process that you just described there and how that fits into the Bible. All right. So here's what I would, here's what I would omit if I am doing this, doing the light and darkness Bible study. Now, at the point of doing light and darkness, I've already done discipleship. I've already done the kingdom. I've already done everything else. So I'm not going to ask the person when they became a Christian. Because by that point, they're, real, they're not a Christian, right? So I'm not going to ask that. I'm not going to ask um, when they became a disciple. We already established that they're not disciples because they're not living by the scripture. So I wouldn't ask them. Everything else, I would still ask. It's still enough information to clearly paint the picture of just a kind of wonky spiritual conversion. Now, if we take a, if we took a quick pulse, right? And Zoom doesn't allow you to do like polls, but raise your hand if, I mean, this, is this far-fetched? I mean, a lot of us on this call can probably raise our hands and say this conversion, like role play exercise mirrored what we probably said before us becoming disciples, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, it is not just uh, so uncommon. What I'm describing here, it happens all the time. I get this all the time. So Amen, bro. Convict me. Uh, it's so true. So we're going to go into the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, Earl, and we're going to discuss, um, first off, we're going to look at... Um, you know, the, the topic of darkness in the Bible study, what does that mean? You know, because I think we have to look at how does God look at this world? You know, he looks at the world very differently from you and I. So it's, it's important that we dive into it and get God's perspective. Um, because, geez, there's so much confusion nowadays. And it's so awesome that we can go into God's word and hear exactly what he wants to hear. So First Peter chapter uh, 2 and in verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What an incredible passage here, because, you know, in this passage, we see here that Peter is reminding the disciples that already saved as far as where they were, where God took them out of, and where they are now. And, and he tells them, look, now you are a holy nation. Now you're a royal priesthood. Isn't that incredible, Earl, that, you know, uh, I grew up believing that only certain people were priests. You know, they wore like these long robes, these kind of funny cone, hat, cone uh, hats and, 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 and you know, and, and, but yet the Bible says here that every single disciple is a priest. Isn't that incredible? Um, when we're God's people. And it says here that you were taken out of the darkness into his wonderful light. See, from God's perspective, there's only two places someone can be spiritually. Either they're in the light or they're in the darkness. And here we see that he says that once you were not a people of God, you know, this is such a misconception today that, everyone, that people, a lot of people believe that everyone's God's people. Everyone's God's people. And the Bible here clearly tells us that's not the case. Not everyone's God's people. He specifically calls this out because there's a point in time where someone becomes God's people. The second thing it says is that they, had, they no longer had, they, at one point they had no mercy. Now what's mercy, Earl? How would you describe mercy? Well, mercy, um, I would say, um, you know, when someone's being kind to you. All right, that's, that's not bad, you know. Have you ever been in front of a courtroom, Earl? Yeah, I have. Uh, for what? Uh, speeding ticket. All right, yeah, I can relate to that. I've had that in my time, unfortunately. It happens to all of us at some point or another. But now when you walk into a courtroom... That courtroom is like its own nation for the judge. Now, the judge is, is everything. He is the authority. He can look at your case, look at your record, and see you have no other misdemeanors, no other uh, crimes against you, and he can make a decision to just give you a slap on the wrist and let you go, right? He, he can have mercy on you. Or he can be, be having a bad day, his coffee tasted terrible, and he's like, you know what? This guy needs to pay a pretty decent fine, and he issues the fine, right? He, he, he has complete authority to do that, right? Mercy would be like, he lets you go. He does not treat you as the crime deserves. The Bible says that when we are in darkness, there is no mercy. So at the last day, when you and I are judged by God, and we have no mercy, he's going to look at our life, and then the crime or the punishment will fit the crime. It doesn't matter how much we plead. It doesn't matter anything. It is done. And there'll be no mercy. That's an intense place to be. And here the Bible says that they were taken out of a place where there was no mercy. And now they were brought to mercy. Let me show you. Let me kind of diagram this a little bit here as well. Um, let me clear this out and draw something here for us. Uh, let's see if we can do this on Zoom. Not the easiest task, but let's give it a shot. All right, Earl. So think of it this way. Um, so on one side, you got God. All right. On the other side, you got Satan. Move this over. All right, fair enough. All right, so here we have good. Whoops. Here we have evil. And what we're all, all, all we're doing, um, Earl, is seeing how God sees the world. Okay. Uh, can everyone still see this? Everyone can see this? Yes. Yes, bro. Yes. Yeah, bro. Come on, bro. This is it. Okay. Great, bro. All right. Yeah. So on this side, we have the 20,000. Remember that from the passage in the book of Luke, chapter 14, when we read what it means to be a disciple? Yeah, so what would be on this side, Earl? The 10,000? Yep, that's right. Um, and um, so on this side, as we read here, is the light, right? On this side, you have darkness, right? Um, and then on this side, according to this passage, and when we're with God in the light, what, are we God's people? Yeah, we're God's people, right? 
Um, so now on this side, uh, you're still a people, right? You're still a human being, but whose people are you? Yep, you're saints. Now, this does not mean you're out there sacrificing cats and uh, killing babies. It just means that you've been taken captive by the devil. Make sense, Earl? Yeah. All right. Um, now, the scripture also says that if you're with God in the light, you have mercy. Man, do I need mercy. In the darkness, there is no mercy. You know, no mercy. Now, if I'm in God's side, right, I'm in the light, uh, I'm in the I'm in the twenty thousand. I'm God's people. Am I um, a disciple or not a disciple, Earl? Disciple for sure. Yeah, I agree. And then the opposite goes here. Um, I think you kind of get the idea. Not a disciple. Um, now remember that a disciple and a Christian are they different or are they the same thing? They're the same. Yeah, great job. Remember that. So where would a Christian be? Oh, on this side, yep, you got it. If a Christian goes here and not a Christian goes there. Um, and all right, Christian. All right, now if I'm a disciple, all right, I'm a Christian as the Bible describes it, not how it's watered down today. Uh, I'm God's people, I'm in the light, you know, I'm with God. Am I saved? Yeah, of course, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, uh, which means what? What does it mean? Where's my eternal destination? yeah absolutely um all right so all right for the sake of time guys i'm gonna skip did you guys get the point so uh lost and help all right so does that make sense earl like you know there's only two play there's no gray area there's no gray. There, there's no there is no i i'm 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 on my way to the light um it's as you know i'm in one place or in another uh either i'm I, i'm building god's kingdom or i'm tearing it down I'm with him or I'm against him. Uh, I'm in the 20,000 or I'm in the 10,000. There's, there's only two places someone can be spiritually. Uh, now, it's not what the world wants you to believe, right? The world wants you to believe that you can be in some sort of like gray area. You know what I mean? As long as I am better than so-and-so, then that's okay. Uh, from God's perspective, that doesn't work that way. It's one or the other, all right? So based on how you're living your life today, up, up until what you've been learning, where are you currently, Earl? Are you in the light or in the darkness? Which side? I'm in the light. Okay, let's, let's think through this, right? Now, we've been studying the Bible now, and we talked about what it means to be a disciple. And what it means to be a disciple is that you, at some point, someone sat down with you and made you into one. Not, we, we're not born, even if we grew up in a Christian environment, none of us are born Christians. None of us are born disciples. We have to be taught and made into one. And then our purpose, our life would, would model that of making other disciples. We even know what, that, we know what that means. At one point, we left everything. And it only, only then were we disciples. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay, let me, let me change my answer. No, no, I, I'm in darkness. Yeah, that's right, because you're not currently there. But now, do you want to stay in darkness? No, absolutely not. That's awesome. And we're going to talk about how to get out of the darkness. But I think first, if we want to move forward and understand God's will for our lives, we have to first understand where we are. And we can't get sentimental, Earl. You know what I mean? This world is full of sentimentality, and we can't get that way. We have to take a hard look at the scriptures, put ourselves in the mirror, and say, all right, what does my life look like? So that we can actually get out of it. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 59. It's so crucial, guys, that, that, we, that we solidify this part. Hopefully by this point, and sometimes it happens when so, someone regresses back. It's because they've been studying the Bible and you've been doing such a great job putting faith into them that they think, well, that means I'm in the light. But we have to help them understand that that's not necessarily the case. So uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 59. And we'll see how is it that you and I uh, ended up in darkness. Because uh, I might be a disciple now, Earl, but I wasn't always a disciple. I was in, dar in darkness myself, and there was something that got me there. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59. Let's start off in verse 1. It says, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, 
but your inequities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you will not hear. Now, what an incredible passage. Uh, what, what do you get out of this passage? What is it that separates you and I from God? Well, um, hmm. it says your, your inequities. Yeah, that's another word for your shortcomings or your sins. So it's, it's, it's not that God can't hear us. It's not that he can't help us. He wants to, but there's something that is separating him, something that is preventing him from being able to uh, save you and save me, and that is called sin. It even happened in the Gospels when Jesus was on the cross, which we'll study tomorrow. When Jesus is on a cross, and for the very first time, or you'll, we'll read this tomorrow, where God had to abandon Jesus because in that moment, God limited himself to Jesus for the sins of this world. And Jesus cries out in a loud voice saying, Lama, Lama, Sabachthani. And, and, and he said, why have you forsaken me? In other words, and God left him. I like to think about it this way, just give you a, a small illustration, um, is that there's really, you know, two places as we kind of learned earlier. Uh, let me see, let me do this better. Let's write a little help you out here. Um, there's only two places someone can be, right? Come on, bro. Let's see what my drawing oh, abilities are. All right, here we go. This is not as easy as it looks, guys. Um, let's see. All right, here we go. All right, so we got God on one side, right? And then what's on the other side? It's us, right? Now, this thing in the middle here, this thing in the middle here, it is, what would we call this? Now imagine it's all filled up, right? Just for the sake of drawing here. This, yeah, is sin. So this is what separates you and I from God. You know, here you have light, whoops, uh, and here you have darkness. Now, if I wanna have, if I wanna be with God, Earl, right? I wanna be on this side. How do I do that? I mean, imagine it's like it's a closed room. There's no windows, there's no doors, there's nothing. There, there's a wall in the middle and you wanna get to the other side. How do you do that? How do you go to the other side? What has to happen? Well, I guess I gotta break the wall. Exactly it. The only way for you and I to have and come into a relationship with God is that this wall called sin has to be broken down. That is the only way. And this is super important, Earl, because the point in time in the scriptures when someone receives forgiveness of sins, this is the point in time when someone goes from darkness over to light. You have to stress this very, very, very important point is when that wall is broken, that means forgiveness of sins happen. And that's when you go from darkness into light. So far, so good, Earl? Got it? Awesome. All right, let's go to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. All right. Romans three and verse 23. So we understand how from God's vantage point, how it looks at the world, there's only two places someone can be. We know what God is there is sin. But let's look at this a little bit further here in verse 23. Uh, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how many have sinned? It says all, everybody, every single person. Well, how, how, you know, some people say, well, how about that one guy in the Amazon forest who's never heard of Jesus? I mean, honestly, the likelihood today that uh, people have not heard of Jesus is a bit like even crazy to think about because we have so much technology and so much going on. I bet you there's even like a little church there in the jungle, maybe preaching false doctrine, but there's probably one anyway. But we go, let, let's, let's say that, okay, let's say that there's someone in the Amazon in some remote forest who's not heard of Jesus, right? The Bible says that you will, if, if you are not exposed to the law, you will be judged by your conscience. Now, who has kept their conscience? Nobody has. Nobody has. 
That person will be judged by their conscience. Ah, you go. Every single person has sinned. Every single person is, has fallen short of the glory of God, and we all need to go from darkness over to light. Let me give you an illustration here, um, or if I may. Uh, let's, let's see if I can get this done here. So imagine that I can somehow quantify sin. Like we, I can make it tangible, you know? And let's, we're going to draw my sin. Now, you know, I, I probably have the least, so, but I'm just going to draw me. Um, and I'll put my initial. I put F. All right. But let's, let's draw, let's pick someone. Let's, let's draw uh, Job, Job Sterling. Now, Job, Job, there's a lot of sin there. A lot of sin. Um, and um, so we got to pray for Job. Um, so we'll, we'll just say J for Job. All right. Now, if, now, if we would draw Tyler's sin. Bob. There, there is. Take um, it easy, man. I don't oh, think it God. fits on the page. Oh, oh oof, here we go. So that's, that's a lot going on there. Um, I'm going to say T for. T for Tamara. Tyler. Tyler Sears. Um, so let's, but let's Tamara. go one more. Let's go one more. Let's, let's get Jay Hernandez. Now, Jay. Yes. He's, he's lived more, most than, than all of us. I mean, he was around when Abraham was there and Moses. And so, you know, there's a lot going on there. So I, oh, I, kinda, yeah. I think on, Jay. Zoom is limiting me to how the size I could do. So uh, we'll say J-H, just to separate Job from J. Let's talk about that. All right. So the question is, Earl, who is closest to God? Well, um, I, was, I, I guess I would say you. I mean, you get the least sin. Well, think about it this way, right? Um, how many sins did it take Adam to be kicked out of the garden? Just one sin. That's it. See, the reality is, Earl, is that regardless of the quantity, God does not look at the quantity of sin. The point is you sinned. And once you sin, that wall between you and God gets built up and you get separated from God. Now, the truth is that, you know, although there is um, sin is the same from God's perspective, on this earth, different sins have different consequences. You know, I, I go to Safeway and I steal a piece of gum. I get caught by, you know, Safeway security. Uh, I might like be looked at, you know, in a funny way and then told to run out or I'm going to get arrested. Um, now if I kill someone, I'm going to go to prison, life sentence, and who knows, right? So there, on this earth, there's different consequences for sin, but in it, the eternal consequence is the same for everyone if there is sin, regardless of what it is. Now, you know, if, um, so how do, how do we get here? You know, at some point, you and I started sinning, you know, and, 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 and this wall started being built up. Now, the Bible says that all have sinned. Now, how about like um, uh, people like Mother Teresa? I mean, she did a lot of good work, you know. Uh, how about her? Did she sin? Yep, she sinned. Um, how about Gandhi? Yeah, Gandhi too. Uh, how about, uh, I mean, think of anybody else. Right. They've all sinned. Now, you know, if you look at their life and they weren't following the scriptures, even as good people as them would be in the same place as Adolf Hitler. Isn't that crazy? It, it does not matter if one like created a genocide and somebody else sinned in different amounts. If there is a wall of sin that separates them from God and it's not been forgiven, then they're both going to end up in the same place. It's intense, but that's how God views it. And we have to accept his message. Not accepting his message, not accepting his word. What would you call that, Earl? It's rebellion. Rebellion if we don't accept God's word. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Come on, bro. To see the seriousness of what God is saying here. 
Because some people don't really believe this. I mean, honestly, some people maybe on this call don't believe this. They say, well, I don't really believe it. Mean, how is it possible that Mother Teresa out, bro. and Hitler are actually going to end up in the same place? Well, let's look at here in Revelation 21. Revelation 21. There's only one standard, only one truth, either light or darkness. If there were not disciples of Jesus Christ believing the doctrine that we see in the scriptures, then no matter how good from the world's perspective, how religious they may be, if they were sincere but not full of truth, then the eternal uh, consequence is the exact same thing from God's perspective. Revelation 21 and verse 6, it says, He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all the liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Isn't that intense? I mean, the Bible says here that the cowardly and the unbelieving are going to be in the same place as the murderers. So if I, have, if I give in to cowardice and say, I, I, I don't know if I can be a disciple, you know, like, What's up, bro? I, I, you know, and I, and I cave in to the pressure of my mama. Because my mama doesn't really agree with, with what I'm doing because it's too radical and she's afraid I'm going to drop out of school and I'm going to like not focus on school and just never see me as committed to the Bible. So automatically, because it's too much commitment, it must be wrong. And I give in. I, I become a coward. I don't stand up for truth. I don't stand up for Jesus and what's right. I don't love God above all things. The Bible says that you will end up in darkness in the same place as a murderer. In the same way, the person who is an unbeliever, this is someone who is faithless. This is, I, I don't know that can become a disciple. That person will end up in the same place. Wow. From that perspective, sin is sin. And it creates a wall. And it creates a wall that separates you and I from God. And that wall must be broken. So let's look at what sin is all about, okay? Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. There's kind of, you know, uh, there's kind of two major buckets of sin, if you can think of it that way, um, Earl. There's the sins of commission, the sins we commit, and there's the sins of, sins of omission that we omit. We'll take a look at that here in a few minutes. But let's look at Galatians, chapter 5. These are the sins of commission. Let's pick it up here in uh, Galatians 5. And in verse 19, it says, The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, how serious is God about this, bro? Is he negotiating? He's saying, well, it all depends. No, he says, I warn you, if you live like this, if this is the pattern of your life, you will not be in the kingdom of heaven. It is a non-negotiable. There is no discussion. Don't go into the last day thinking it's going to change his mind. When he says something, he follows through. He's not like you and me, Earl. When God says something, he's going to do it, which is why I've been trying to urge you to be urgent, if that makes sense. No, I get it, man. I get it. Awesome. Well, let's, 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 let's go through these because something I think is, you know, sin even is crazy. Even in our uh, pop culture, watered down Christianity, you know, go and get an injection of Jesus every Sunday and then leave and come back. Sin's not even talked about nowadays. Isn't that crazy? I mean, the, the, the biggest mm -hmm. thing that separates us from God is not talked about, but we're going to talk about it tonight, all right? So let's look at here, and the first one says sexual immorality. That is sex outside of the design for sex. Sex was designed to happen in marriage. Sex is not bad. It's, just, it's supposed to be done according to the design of God. 
So anything outside of that is sexual immorality. So what does that include? That does include adultery, that does include homosexuality, that does include uh, child abuse, that does include rape, it includes all those things. How about the next one? It says impurity. This is the opposite of holiness. It could be like sexual uh, impurity. Uh, you know, nowadays, I think it was Oprah or one of those talk shows that someone got up and started defending masturbation as if it was something okay to do. I have, I have a hard time picturing being at the last day in front of Jesus and Messiah himself and trying to justify why I could live a life full of masturbation and impurity in my life and say that would so get me to heaven. I just have a hard time picturing Jesus saying, yep, you know what? That's totally fine. You got urges, no problem, go ahead. Impurity. This involves lust, involves pornography. I mean, the pornography industry, it is incredible. I think I read a stat the other day, it's like 5 billion industry. And the number of people who watch it on a daily basis just goes up and goes up. And you know, what people don't understand is what it does to people's brains and how it, it even affects marriages and intimacy and so much going on there. So it, obviously the, the, the sexual side of impurity is there. Uh, even like immodesty could be impure. Um, um, we talked about lust, things like that, but uh, also impure thoughts. It could be impure motives. So like, I'll only help you if you do something for me. Like, it's not very sincere, not genuine, you know, like it, it's, it, yes, you got other alter, or ulterior motives for why you do something. Debauchery, this is not something that, you know, you commonly hear today, but it's doing anything in excess. So what could this be? I mean, this could be overeating, right? It could be over It could be overworking. It could be uh, playing Call of Duty for like the end hours of the night. Um, I, I, I know of like in the world, there are people who are destroying their marriages and even like neglecting their kids because they're, they're locked on their PlayStation for hours and hours and hours on end. This is called debauchery. This is doing something in excess. Um, even what may be appear good can be debauched. See, God is a God of order, not of disorder. The next one, it says here, idolatry. And yeah, it refers to, you know, back in the Old Testament times, people would set up actual idols, the Baals, and would worship them. And I know I grew up with that. I grew up, I grew up uh, and, and brought up in the Catholic tradition. And we had idols throughout my house. We had the Virgin Mary. We had this idol and this idol. For some reason, we had an idol in the restroom. I don't know. I, to this day, I don't even understand that. Why would you put a, an idol in the restroom? But that's a whole different topic. Um, sure, it, it talks, it's about that. You, you're not supposed to worship anything else but Christ. But it's really anything that you and I put before God. And, and debauchery and idolatry, they almost go hand in hand because typically what you're idolatrous towards is what you're debaucherous towards, you know? And a lot of times, you know, it could be something like, it could be even like your job, you know, where it's like you put that before God and that your job causes you to compromise what you know is right and what you know you must do because you're working extra hours and you have to do this. Uh, how about the concept of like changing our job so we can actually worship God, right? Um, that, that's actually possible to do. But we, we make choices. The world makes choices every single day. And that itself can be what we worship. For some people, it can be even relationships. Like the, 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 the idea that she is going to break up with me. Like, oh my God, like if I do this, she's going to break up with me. Like, oh my God, like what am I going to do? I mean, I've been, we've been dating for like two months and man, I had dreams, you know, I had visions of us getting married and, you know, and, and, and it's crazy, you know, it, 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 we get so consumed by this. And it's like, you put that relationship before God, you know what I mean? Um, and so it could be so, it could be a sport. It could be uh, a passion. It could be a dream. It could be anything that you put before God. And typically you're debaucherous. You're, you're, you're doing it in excess. For a lot of people, I know for me, it was really just me. I was, I, was, I was my own idol. I was my own God, you know, whatever I wanted, I would do. And it was a very selfish way to live, but um, witchcraft. 
Sure, it, you know, it refers to things like horoscope and palm readings and Ouija board and all different things. And but if you look at the Greek word, that that word witchcraft comes from the word pharmacia, which where we get the word pharmacy. See, back in those days, you know, as part of like the ritual process, they would induce you with with um, you know different things to 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 impair your judgment. So that was all part of that process. Which today it could be anything related to drugs, you know. Um, uh, you name it, anything that impairs your judgment, because the Bible says you must love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your, all your mind. So I'm supposed to have a clear sense of mind. I have supposed to have a, I'm supposed to be able to have um, not an impaired judgment, but be able to make good decisions. Uh, I can't do that if I'm under the influence of something. So uh, witchcraft, hatred. Uh, I think hatred is one of those things where Something we can overlook, guys, as we're going through this Bible study with people, is the sin of the heart that, that it, it goes deep. I know for me, uh, that was probably one of my top three sins before I became a disciple, resentment and bitterness. You know, there's a lot of that. Um, so that is a part of discord. You know, discord is um, like when you're playing an instrument and like you're playing a guitar and there's a, there's a chord that goes out of, out of tune, out of harmony. That's this, this discord. You know, a lot of us, you know, we kind of grew up in broken homes or in homes where we were neglected and we use discord to get attention. You know what I mean? We walk into the fellowship and, you know, and we want everyone to know that we're super discouraged. We want everyone to know that we're so down, that we had a bad day, that we had a bad week, and, and it's discordious. It's discordious, you know what I mean? And it, it, it does not promote unity. It does not promote harmony. It separates people, right? And discordious, being discordious is a sin. Jealousy, now jealousy and envy, they're similar. What's the difference? You know, jealousy is having a fear of people taking something that you have. Envy is wanting something that something has, that somebody has, you know? So what is the most classic example of jealousy is the jealous boyfriend, right? Like he had, he's in a relationship and he was no one to talk to her, to talk to him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's really a, a, a fear of a loss of control, you know? Um, jealousy, envy, both of those create a lack of contentment we're never happy we're never satisfied we're looking at other people and we're always wondering why is it that this is why, why is it that i'm not the one speaking why is it i'm the one you know given an opportunity i'm like, i got talents too i got gifts too i mean you know what why am i not being chosen to be on this mission team to do this to that it can even happen to us guys like we can be it, we can struggle with envy even in the kingdom and the good things that we do uh so we have to be careful with this uh, next one says fits of rage. And this is trying to get control. I think I grew up in an environment full of fits of rage. Like my parents could use anger and can use a fit of rage to get you to do anything. I mean, you would not mess around. They were like, it was, it was, a, it was a rage and, and it worked. I mean, I was not messing around. And, but we could grow up like that. And, it, and a fit of rage can be manifested in like hitting things, right? You're, you're hitting walls, you're, 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 you're you got road rage and, and, and it's really a lack of control. You know, you're out of control. God is a God of self-control, right? We're supposed to be self-controlled and this is the opposite, right? There is no discipline of our emotion, um, fits of rage. Selfish ambition. Now, let me ask you though, is it wrong to be ambitious? I don't think so. Nope. Nothing wrong with being ambitious. You know, actually, if you're going to be a disciple, Earl, you should have the ambition to want to be the best son. Like, now that you're going to become a disciple, you should be a better son. You should be a, a better husband, a better wife, a better friend, because you got Jesus as your Lord. So none of that, don't use the Bible or Jesus or anything to be an excuse why you should be pushing yourself to be a better in whatever thing you're doing. You should be a better student. There should be no disciple flunking any classes. There should be no disciples getting C's and D's. It should not happen. We should be getting B's and A's, guys. All right? We should have the ambition to be excellent. The problem is when we sin, it will become selfish ambitious. So when our ambition gets in the way of God, 
and it causes us to compromise what is right. I think a lot of times this can happen even in the kingdom around leadership. Like people will get upset that they're not leading Bible studies. Like why isn't, why can't I lead Bible studies? You know, why is it that this person leads Bible studies? I don't lead Bible studies. You know, it got, let, let me just be very clear. There are lots of people to save. There's lots of people to, there's a lot of work to do here at Dallas Fort Worth. You'll get your shot. Do not worry. We want everyone to be able to get their hands to working for the Lord. Uh, but let's not be selfishly ambitious. Amen. You know, if you keep reading here, what's the next one? It says dissensions. You know, dissensions is a, is a nasty one because this is those people who really do not like authority in their life. Even the word leader kind of makes them cringe. Like the little hairs in the back of their neck, it just, they're, right now they're standing up because the, the, the idea of, of authority and leadership, this person is dissentious, you know? Here's how, here's how it looks. So let's say, for example, that Tyler is running a campaign in the campus ministry. He says, all right, guys, we're going to go, we're going to, okay. we're going to, we're going to do the um, Go for Glory campaign. And in the Go for Glory campaign, we're going to share with 30 people a day. We're going to, we're going to pray for 30 minutes and we're going to do whatever else. And people around you are like fired up. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And that one brother is like, All right. Um, Bob. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Um, and that person is already causing a division amongst that group. But see, what dissentious people do is they don't keep it to themselves. They try to go and find somebody else who's dissentious. So they'll go to try to find amongst the fellowship who is, and usually they'll go like to the young Christian, you know, and or they'll go to someone who they think is maybe not doing well spiritually and they'll say hey did, did, you know did you did you hear about so and so you know and imagine imagine that you know that uh, alan's being dissentious you know what i mean um and he hears tyler the campaign he's like you know like what 30 30 people 30 I mean, someone alan a class that got yeah, this is a mess like so then he goes around the fellowship and then he, he's talking to geo and and, and and he's like geo did, did you hear what tyler said i mean 30 people like you know, and, and like, what do you think about that? And, and, and Gio says, yeah, man, it's awesome. Let's, let's, let's do it. I'm fired up. And, and, and Alan will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is awesome. And then, then he goes to find somebody else, you know, and then, uh, he finds Matthew and, and he goes, hey, hey Matthew, did, did, you, did you hear the, the campaign met 30 people a day? Like, you know, it's like, what's up with that? He says, yeah, man, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I, I'm actually struggling. Yeah, man. I mean, for sure. I mean, this is like, what is Tyler thinking? I mean, and, and, and now it's two people. Dissensions is a pretty big deal, guys, because it creates division. Yeah. You know, it creates division. You know, look at how the Bible deals with division. Look at Titus 3. It's very different from Matthew, Matthew 18. It says, warn them once, warn them twice, and they have nothing to do with them. The Bible is very, very hard line when it comes to division. So dissension is a, a serious thing. And, and growing up, maybe you were someone that hated authority and had a hard time being teachable, had a hard time with correction. Like if someone corrects you, you spin out. And it takes you a couple of days to kind of come back and recoup and, and, and get patched up. You know what I mean? Like this is something that my daughter goes through right now. You know what I mean? She, she's learning how to be corrected, learning how to be trained. But some of us are, are adults with a, 20, with a 10 year old character inside of us that we have a hard time being corrected and we start spinning out, man. Like that's dissension. It does not create unity, it's, it's division. What does this do? It creates a faction and I've seen it. Usually it starts up with discord, lack of harmony, it goes to dissension because you don't like authority. You think you have the better plan, the better idea. And then you grab around you enough people who think the same thing you do, and you create your little group within a group. That's what a faction is. Now, a faction could be a lot of things. It could be, uh, it could be like um, being prejudiced. You know what I mean? Like you, I'm only hanging out with the Hispanics. You know? uh, I'm only hanging out with the whites or with the blacks or with the Asians or whatever it is, whatever your feel is. Or I'm, I'm, it could be cliques. That's like, I could be a faction. You know, I'm only hanging out with the jocks. I'm only hanging out with so-and-so with the, with this, this and that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a faction. You know what I mean? 
even something as controversial as Black Lives Matter can be a faction. And you have to hear me straight. Like we are a group who are going to build harmony and, and unity and not division. The kingdom oh, is a place of unity. So we have to make sure that we don't create factions here. All right. This is a sin. Clicks, things of that nature. What else does it say? It says envy, drunkenness. And drunkenness is really um, anything that's going to impair your judgment. It could be drunkenness. Orgies. And this could be group sin. And, you know, it, it could be uh, vandalism, right? We're going together as a group of people to go vandalize. We're going to go sin together. It could be, it could even be the club scene, right? It's like, no, 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 that's not true, man. I mean, I, I, I'm going to go there to let my light shine. I'm going to go there to make disciples. All right. So you're going to go to the club uh where people go really for one single purpose like they're going there to sin this is an orgy do you know what i mean like let's be real you know um and it says and the like so this is not an exclusive list the list goes on and on and on let's look at one more second timothy chapter three so depending on who you're studying with you know um because if you look at this list a lot of these things were in my life and, you know, we'll have an opportunity here to kind of understand what that looks like. But here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. You know, um, if you're studying with someone who's very, very religious, guys, you got to hit this one, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From God's perspective, just looking religious, having a Bible, even going to church, having a form of godliness, but not being a true disciple, that is sin from God's perspective. Let's look at James chapter 4. So those are the sins of commission, um, Earl. Let's look at sins of omission and, and better get a gauge of what this means. Look at verse 17. It says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. So if you know that you should be a disciple, you should leave everything. You should make the Bible your standard and not what your grandpa said, and you don't do it, you're sinning. And that very sin will take you to hell on the last day. That's why we're in darkness. Because even there's a thing that we should be doing that we're not doing and that we omit. So now, if you turn the page of James chapter 5, as you become a disciple, Earl, and you come into the kingdom, the culture is that you're going to repent of your sins and you should not be going back to those the way that you used to. But the reality is that between now and all the way to getting to heaven, you and I are going to fall short. And what is the culture of the kingdom? How do we deal with sin when we are disciples? Okay, look at James chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and is effective. Now, it says here to confess your sins to who? To a priest? That's not, that's not what it says, right? What does it say? It says, confess your sins to each other. Who are they each other? He's talking to disciples. So disciples should be confessing their sin to one another. Now, for what purpose? To get forgiveness? No, only God can forgive our sins, right? The Bible says that it should be for healing and so that we can pray for one another. There's a power that designed by God, Earl, when you and I are living transparent lives, when we are our open book. It, you know, it would be so easy, Earl, if, you, if the moment you get converted, you go straight to heaven. And you don't have to deal with me and you. 
that we don't have to deal with this nasty world and get our feet dirty. But the reality is that we do. And when that happens, God wants us to actually practice Christianity and learn the virtue of humility. That is baked into the plan of God. Confession to one another requires a desire to please God and not please men. And this is the culture. This is, so I want to I wanna model for you what this looks like, all right? Because I know it's going to be new for you. I know it was new for me. Let, me. let me model it for you, okay? Let's go to Galatians 5. Let's go back to that. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now, we read this, right? But we'll go through it together. And I typically read it again. And after that, I read it, right? I say, all right, guys, let's, to the brothers here, let's, let's model for Earl what this looks like in the kingdom. So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to pick your top two, top three sins that were in your life prior to you being a disciple. And I want us to be open and help to help Earl to get to see a little bit of who we were. Now, you know, let's for sake of time, I know we can spend hours doing this, but let's, let's just be succinct, but let's share top two, top three sins that were in your life. And I'll typically start, you know, so I'll, I'll pick some of the top two heavy ones that were in my life because I want Earl to, to quickly see that I'm, I'm trusting him, you know, and I'll put a disclaimer out there. I'll say, Hey, just so you know, I'm, I'm going to be open here. So, you know, I'm expecting you're not going to go on Facebook tonight and say, Hey, Fernando, this is that, right? Like I'm trusting you, you trusted me. This is the nature of the kingdom where we trust one another. Right. And so we'll go top two, top three, the brothers go this and say, all right, Earl, you got to hear some of our junk and this is who we were. And by the, by the glory and mercy and grace of God, we are who we are today. We weren't always like this. And hopefully at that point, Earl is feeling comfortable and says, okay, I'll be open as well. You know what I mean? And he gets, he, he, he just gets, gets a handle of how to do that because he's going to have to learn how to do that in the kingdom, right? And after that, I say, Earl, let's do this, you know? Because I think we live in such a desensitized world today that we will even look at videos online of, of sick kids in third world countries and doesn't move our hearts. You know, our, our hearts are so callous and so hard that in order for us to be able to repent, our hearts need to be soft. The Bible calls it the good soil. So when the, the word of God gets planted on it, it can produce an incredible crop. So I'm going to give you an exercise, all right? I want you to write a letter. Write a letter to God, and this is in the form of a list, okay? Go through this passage and start documenting for yourself, right? Like one by one. Try to remember as much as you can. And what the purpose of this is to break that thing. I know you get it up here. You read it. But it has to go from here to there. So start breaking the heart. But you got to come in touch with what sin is. Does that make sense, Earl? How do you feel about that? I'm, I'm, I'm good. Awesome. And then we can review it together when we do the next Bible study. Okay? Awesome. All right. So let's go to Romans chapter 6. Come on, babe. Let's do this. All right. So, Earl, we've talked a lot Come about on, darkness here. All right. I want to oh, encourage bro. you with this scripture here. Verse 23 of chapter six. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What is a wage, Earl? It's something you get for something else, right? Yeah. You know, um, a wage is the wages of sin what you should receive as a result of sin in your life, the Bible says is death. But the gift of God, and that's what God is offering you. You don't have to stay in darkness. But that's not where you need to stay. That's not where God wants you to stay. This is why God went through all the effort, remember, to set the times and the places where you were sitting on that bench on the campus reading your book, and then so-and-so came up to you and said, if you wanted to study the Bible, that is called grace. And now you have the opportunity to accept this gift that God's going to offer you, you know. So do you want to get into the light, Earl? You want to know what that looks like? Yes, please, very much. All right. Now, at this point, I do New Testament conversion, you know, right? I don't go through, I, I'll go through the basic version of the light study if, if it's someone that has very little religious background, okay? Um, outside of that, 
I do New Testament conversion because I find that people need to get a more robust view of how to get into the light to, it adds a lot more cement to, to this so they can actually um, fight against all the false doctrine that is out there. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do this as quickly as I can, okay, so that you guys get a handle on this. Um, it's, it's, this is very different from how you'll see in the first principles book, okay? Luke 22. Luke 22, use the first principles light study if you're studying with just a pagan, okay? Has no religious background, maybe an atheist, maybe something like that who has no background. Keep it simple, sure. But someone with more religious background, you might wanna add a little more cement, okay? So Luke chapter 22, and I'm gonna go this really quick. So let's go Luke 22, verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the last supper. Jesus with his disciples, and he said, Look, I'm going to die soon. A new covenant is going to be established, and it's going to be established in my blood. Very key. This new covenant is in his blood. What does that mean? Let's look at it here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. So this is looking at the light portion of it from a new covenant perspective. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So what is Christ's role? He is the mediator of the new covenant. How? through his blood. Verse 16, it says, in the case of a will or a covenant, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when somebody has died and never takes effect while the one who made it is living. What does this mean? Say me and Jackie write a will saying, all right, our kids are going to get our Honda. That's basically what we got. Um, amen. That's cranking. Um, it, it would be, if Andrea tries to go to, I don't know who they, she would go to, to say, all right, hey, I, 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 wanna, I wanna take action on this will. Let's say, well, is your dad, did he pass away? No, did your mother pass away? No, then this, this, this contract is, is, is nullified. You cannot take action at it. The person who died, that's what makes it go into effect. That's the point of the Hebrew writer here, is that this new covenant, which is in his blood, as he, Jesus said it, only goes into the effect after he dies. Very important. Um, verse 18. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled the blood, both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So the high priest in the Old Testament, under the covenant of Moses, what would he do? He would grab the hyssop. He would, he would dip it in blood and water. He would sprinkle it on the people. And when they would come in contact with the blood, they would be forgiven. He's saying that Jesus said, my covenant is in blood. The Hebrew writer says here is that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So here's the key. When do you and I come in contact with the blood? That's when you and I come into the covenant. That's when you and I come into the light. So we have to find that out. How do I get converted into the new covenant where Jesus is the mediator. It is a covenant of blood. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. We're, we're going to fly through this, guys. Um, um, bro. Romans chapter 10. I just want you guys to have more background on this because we deal with a lot of religiosity here. Okay, so it's important that you guys have a more in-depth uh, study on conversion. Okay. Romans chapter 10, 
Uh, let's look at verse 16 or verse 17, rather, for sake of time. It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So to be converted in this new covenant, Earl, you and I need to have faith. But how do we gain faith? We have to hear the gospel. That's the first step. We have to hear so we can come to faith. It might seem elementary, but it's truth. Look here in verse 4, same chapter. It says, Christ is the end of the law, so there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. In other words, if I want to be converted into this new covenant, if I want to be saved, what do I need? I need to be able to believe in Jesus. Again, it seems elementary, but it's a part of the components of how to get converted in the new covenant of blood. Let's keep reading here. Uh, and don't shy away from this passage because it's key. It's what everyone uses to preach false doctrine, okay? So let's keep reading here in verse 8. Says, what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is a word of faith we're proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are safe. As the scripture says, everyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here is Paul talking to disciples in the city of Rome. Okay, here they had an edict. You had to make sure you proclaim Caesar as Lord. If you do not proclaim Caesar as Lord, you will get killed. So he's reminding them there's only one that we confess as Lord, and that's Jesus. Secondly is, it says that we must confess Jesus as Lord to be saved. Correct, Earl? What must we do this for salvation? Yes, absolutely. You must do it. The question is, is this the only thing we must do? No, that's not what it says there. We must do this. Now, how many times does it take for something in the Bible to be true, Earl? Once. If it says it once, we do it. No matter of opinion, no matter of anything, we must do this. The question is, is it the only thing we must do? The, question, the clear answer is no. But let's keep looking at this. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. This is the next one. that Everyone loves going here. Ephesians chapter 2. So important. Um, look at verse, uh, verse 4. It says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Key word there, Earl made us alive with Christ. We're going to look a little bit later, where is it that we come alive with Christ? Just park that, park that in your mind. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. And the key word there, there's a point in time when you and I get raised up with Christ. We're going to take a look at that in a second. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages... We might show the incomparable riches of his grace, express in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved. Through faith, it is not from yourselves that it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. People stop there. Don't stop there. Keep reading. What is he talking about? What are the works that he's talking about? Keep reading. Therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. That done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ, Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. There's a blood part again. Verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law. So when Paul is talking about here 
the works, he's talking about the works of the law, not that you don't have to do anything. But let's go back to this, right? It says here that you and I are saved by God's grace. What is grace? It's unmerited favor. There's nothing that you can do, Earl, that you and I can do to earn our salvation. I don't care how many times you read your Bible. I don't care about any of that. There's nothing that merits salvation. This is a gift. The fact that you and I get to even be in a Bible study tonight, this is a gift. This is, a, this is God's grace. Now, think about it this way. If I go to Best Buy tomorrow and I buy the biggest flat screen, 75 inches, all right, and I come over to your house, Somehow I get someone to help me to, to, to carry this thing. I ring the doorbell and say, Earl, this is my gift to you. You're like, okay, well, what's, what's the catch? No catch. No, no strings attached. It's free. Take it. Just under this condition, though. Like, don't throw away the box. Open it. Hang it up. Turn it on, whatever you want to do. Don't throw away the box. The fact that I have a term of condition for this free gift, does it stop being free? Of course not. You didn't, you didn't go to Best Buy. You didn't buy. You didn't pay any money for it. I did. I give it to you. There's, the fact that God offers us the gift of salvation, this free gift, under his terms, does not make it unfree. It is still grace. It must just be received in the term that he outlined. How did he outline it? We must hear. We must believe. We must confess. The question is, is that it? That is not it, Earl. Let's keep reading. It says you're saved by grace through faith. The question is, what is biblical faith? Let's look at it. James chapter 1. James 1. Uh, obviously, if well, I'm doing this with Earl, you. I'm I'm going a little slower, but I'm flying through this. James chapter 1. At this point, I'm trying to define biblical faith, okay? Because I just abolish here the fact that the works he's talking about are the works of the law. The religious world says, see, it says it there. You, you, you can't do anything. Let me ask you this. The Bible just said in Romans chapter 10 that to be able to gain faith, I have to hear. Now, that means I have to actually pick up my Bible, and read so I can hear the word. So I can't do that there. I can't go to church. I can't go on the Zoom call. I can't do anything if, it's, if I'm not supposed to do anything. It's, it's, it's a foolish argument. It's a foolish, foolish argument. Number one, the scripture is out of context to begin with, but you have to keep reading. James chapter 2 and in verse uh, 16. It says, What good is it, my brothers? The man claims to have faith, but has no deeds. Can such faith save him? Rhetorical question, but we know the answer is clearly no. It says, suppose the brother says he goes without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep born well fed, but there's nothing for his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by deeds, it's dead. Someone will say, hey, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence of faith without deeds is useless? I love this because James uses Abraham, the father of all faith, to set it up his argument. He said, look, all right, let's check out Abraham. Consider righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. What's interesting, Earl, is that there's this doctrine that uh, started, off, started off in the 1800s that it, it's basically said, all you have to do is believe in Christ and accept him into your heart. And, and that's all you need to do for salvation. The only place in the entire Bible where the word alone and faith are together is when it says not to do that. When not to do that, not to do it, not to do that. This is biblical faith, actions and belief working together. That is biblical faith is accepting the gift under the conditions that God has outlined. What is the outline? I must hear, I must believe, I must confess. The question is again, is that the only thing? 
It is not. Acts chapter 2. Let's take a look at this. Let's go, bro. How do we get into the light, Earl? How do we get into the light? We want to get out of this darkness, but we got to do it right. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Have you ever, like, Bob, mm, bro. I mentioned this. Do it right, bro. You know, uh, when, you, when you do buy something at Ikea, they do a great job of giving you instructions, right? Uh, and give you very detailed instructions. I've done the mistake in the past where I'm like, ah, this seems pretty simple. I'm meant to do it myself. And it always backfires. I always have to restart the whole thing because I miss one little screw. The Bible is the book of instructions for life. Let's just follow the instructions how God laid them out. Amen. Verse 36. It says, Therefore, let Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom we crucify, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? See, this is the goal, Earl. Is as you go through your sin list, is to get this type of heart that is ready to say, you know what? I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be right with God. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says, repent. The word in Greek is menanoia, which means a paradigm shift. It's a change in direction. I start viewing the world one way, and I start viewing differently now. What influences that paradigm shift? God's word understanding what it means to be a disciple, understanding that, it, that I must leave everything. That's what repentance means. It doesn't mean just stop being immoral. It means start being like Christ. Someone can actually stop drinking, stop smoking, stop going to clubs and not truly repent it because of sins of omission. Because they don't start living like a Christian. They don't start making disciples. They have no clue what even that even means. Becoming more moral is not repentance. It's not feeling sorry. It's not asking for forgiveness of your sins. It doesn't mean any of that. It means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. He says, you must do that first. Then he says, you must be baptized. This is in water, full body immersion. The word baptizo in the Greek, full immersion. For what? What does it say there? It says, for two purposes, forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said, Earl? that his covenant was going to be in the blood. Now, this covenant would only go into effect after he died. And that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So when you and I come in contact with the blood of Jesus, that's when we are forgiven. That's when you and I go into the light. That's when we get into this new covenant of Jesus Christ. And here in this passage, it says that we're forgiven of our sins. So when is it that you and I come in contact with the saving beautiful, holy blood of Jesus Christ at the waters of baptism. Keep it right. simple, bro. This is where it happens. This is what he was talking about. Oh, bro. This is when that wall that's separating you right now from God gets broken down and you cross over from darkness to light. And it is such a beautiful process. And then you get the Holy Spirit living inside of you to give you the power to live this incredible life called being a disciple. After this, for sake of time, I'm not going to go there, but write this stuff down. Um, I do go to Colossians 2, 11 to 13, and I go through a lot of other scriptures. Uh, I look at Paul's conversion. Um, I look at other conversions so they can see just the whole picture. But let's go to Romans chapter 6. I think that's where if you want to, you know, if they haven't seen it by now, I'll cover the other ones. But at a minimum, uh, wrap it up here in Romans 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. See, here's the thing. There's two differences. There's being dead in sin and there's dying to sin. Two different things. There has to be a point in time where you die to sin. When does that happen? Paul says it here. How can we live any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. See, there is this false doctrine that says mm -hmm. the baptism is simply an outward sign to proclaim to the world 
that I'm really getting serious with God of an inward grace. Nowhere in this scripture does it say that this is a symbol of anything. It says that I am participating. That when Christ dies, I die. That is when I die to sin. When I am buried with him in baptism and I am raised with him and united with him as I get raised up from the waters of baptism. It is that is when I die to sin. That is when I get reborn. It is it actual participation in his death, burial, and resurrection through something called faith? If I get baptized and I do not believe that I'm dying with Jesus Christ, you just got wet. You're still dead in your sins. Nothing happened. It's through faith. So, well, that's great. But how about the how about the uh, how about the robber, the thief on the cross? I mean, he didn't get baptized. I mean, what's up with that? I mean, he was there with Jesus, and Jesus told him, "Hey, you'll be with me in paradise." Remember that when Jesus was on this earth, he could say one word. And you would be saved. He could look at you. He could just think it. He was God in the flesh. He had the authority. The Bible says in heaven and on earth. He had that. But here, Paul is describing baptism as the death, burial, and resurrection. Remember what Hebrews 9 said. The, new, the covenant does not go into effect until the person who made it dies. How did it get into the new covenant? It did not even matter until Jesus died, was resurrected. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even in effect. So the thief did not have to get baptized, Earl. But you and I, who are now under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, we have to hear, we must believe, we must confess he's Lord, we must repent, and we must be baptized. What happens, Earl, if I repent? I do everything else, but I do not get baptized. Am I in the light? Nope. What if I get baptized, but I don't repent? Same thing. I must follow the instructions and accept this beautiful free gift of God under the terms that he outlined. I must believe. I must confess. I must repent. This whole event happens in the waters of baptism. And that's when you and I cross over from darkness over to light. If you need some more cement to this, that's when I go to Acts 22 to look at Paul's conversion. And there you see that he, you know, Ananias tells him, hey, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. It would be strange if the writer of Romans, which is Paul, would have dictated any other conversion method that is different from his own doesn't make any sense, right? If we just take Romans 10, we also know that he wrote Romans 6 right before it, right? So, you know, this stuff is pretty basic, guys. You know, so it, it's important that we, I like to go a little deeper when it comes to this Bible, study, especially with, you know, we live in the Bible Bill here of, of America. Um, and people need to understand that being in the light means the covenant of blood. That is when you and I get forgiveness of sins. So, guys, that is a light and dark okay, Bible login. study. I hope that's uh, helpful for you guys. Uh, and we're going to wrap it up right now. Okay, Come on, bro.